Dear Letter to Self, I wanted man to answer my questions about God's plan. Well, God showed up, and when I found the following passage, I knew I had my answer. Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to another episode of Tabernacle Talks. I'm Dr. Michelle, your host, and I am so delighted to have Dr. Melvin Woodard with me today. Dr. Woodard, thank you so much for being on Tabernacle Talks today. Hey, Dr. Michelle, thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of your program. It is absolutely wonderful to see you again and to certainly try to unpack some things today. So well, we're going to unpack a real big food. thing today. <laughs> we're going to unpack a big thing today. We're going to be talking about the mystery of the Nephilim and if there were giants or uh, during the time of the Bible. But before we get to that, I know a lot about you, Dr. Wooder, and I know you do a lot of amazing things, but can you share with our audience a little bit of your background so they'll know just as much as I know about you? <laughs> well, you know what? That's that's probably not good to get me talking about self because it kind of runs on. But here, a few things. I pastor the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church. We are 11 years old, but because of the pandemic last year, we weren't able to celebrate our 10th anniversary. So in just two weeks, we're going to have what we call our 10th plus anniversary celebration of the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church of Indianapolis, Indiana. Congratulations. That's back in May of 2010. Really happy to be pastoring, but um, you know there's 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 quite to the motor that we have. And so I'm grateful to still be an educator um, of on several levels. I am an adjunct with the Indiana University Bloomington. Um, I teach out of Tinley Accelerated Schools here in Indianapolis for their um, advanced college project program. And then I also teach anatomy and physiology at Ivy Tech at uh, Community College in Kokomo. So there's a lot of teaching all week long. Um, absolutely love it. Just, you know, so pastoring and teaching and uh, um, the other things that go along with being married and having four children and four grandchildren and, um, wanting to write more books. You know, our first book came out last year in the process of writing book number two. And um, just grateful to God to be alive and to have uh, the energy that we have and to be able to put it to, to use for his good and glory. <laughs> well, amazing. I know that you're very busy, but I absolutely know that you're an exceptional educator. And so, you know, as my colleague and someone that I've known for many, many years, I was so glad to be able to call on you and you answered the call. So thank you. Uh, because as I started doing more about this subject, I thought I need to call Dr. Woodard for this because I want to make sure that we're biblically sound in some of the things that we're putting on these airwaves. So I'm going to get into this. I, I actually went okay. into the New American Standard Bible and I'm going to hit you with this first question here. Okay. And I was talking about the Nephilim. So if we've got anybody in our audience and they've got their Bible, if they want to turn to Genesis 6 and 4. And what it says there in the NASB version is that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of mankind and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So... I know that Moses is credited with writing this passage in Genesis, but I think there are several terms just in that verse that I'd like you to give us a little bit more in depth so we understand what that verse is telling us. First of all, who or what is the Nephilim? All right, a lot to unpack here. Um, I will direct our attention back uh, to the end of Genesis 4 in just a little bit, but let's 
let's call Genesis 6, 1 to 4, um, uh, an insert that has, uh, it's a very intriguing passage, intriguing story. Um, a number of people have thoughts about what, why is that there? And the why is probably even more important than the what. But the Nephilim, um, it's almost like Melchizedek, come out of nowhere. We haven't heard anything about them in the previous five chapters. There is some more in the Bible about them. But um, men of renown, giants, if you will, there are a number of people who would say that these are angels. I personally don't hold to that idea of them being angels. We'll get into a little bit about that. But they are a very special group of people. Um, they were in those days of old. They DNA, if I can kind of throw that term in there, um, because it's going to come back in, into some of the things that I say later. DNA wise, they had a different structure than the average individual. So they were larger than, than people of old. Um, there are some terms, some other terms, um, and I'll let you go ahead and answer your question, but are they angels or are they renowned men of old? Let's just call them renowned men of old and leave it there for a minute. And I'll, I'll take another question and then come back to kind back of explain. Okay, because there's also another term in that same verse that says sons of God. I and then it goes on to that. mighty men of old. So if you can tell us why we've got all those terms there, what is yeah. that saying? Yes. And so there comes the question, because the sons of God see the daughters of men. And, it, and so the thought process, these are angels. And then there's other places in the Bible talks about fallen angels and being locked up because of what they did. Listen, I think it's really interesting. You've got NASB. I've got ESV, English Standard Version. But I also have the Message Bible with me. And okay. for the, the audience, let me read this from the Message Bible, because it's interesting what it says. Okay. It said, when the human race began to increase with more and more daughters being born, the sons of God noticed the daughters of men were beautiful and they looked them over, picked out wives for themselves. If we look at chapter five, we have really a uh, a lineage, there's 10 ancestors there belonging to the family of Adam, run from Adam to Noah. Okay. These really are the sons of God. It's the divine uh, uh, line, if you will, to Adam. We're going to see it again in several genealogies. Genesis 11, um, Matthew, Luke have genealogies as well. We're going to see this line again. So I take it. Sons of God being that righteous line that God is trying to develop with men. So sons of God, those that are enumerated, because it's interesting that in every generation in chapter five, only one man's name is mentioned. Adam um, and then his son uh, is mentioned. Seth. After Seth comes, you know, uh, Enosh. Enosh, and it goes on down, and I'll let your readers read that. So it mentions just one in each generation. And what God is, is simply trying to point out is that he's looking for this family to be in, in covenant with him, in line with him. And so these sons of God were supposed to be separated from the rest of the world. But here's what happened. More and more daughters are born, daughters unto men. And so the righteous see these unrighteous, if you will, begin to cohabitate with them. And what we see in chapter six, which is part and parcel to the story, is the corruption of earth and greater and greater corruption begins to happen. So the intriguingness of the story in chapter six is that corruption is beginning to fill the earth. The earth was so corrupt, man did it, but it was not supposed to be like that. Righteous men were to be righteous and to have righteous families, righteous wives, righteous children. But that's not the case because like the Nephilim, and I want to go back to where we are, the Nephilim 
they are, are actually the sons of God right before the Nephilim. The sons of God in verse two saw the daughters of men and then they took as their wives any they chose. They saw, they took, they chose. Three key words for why corruption is going to happen in the earth. Men see, they take, they choose, and they don't choose God's path. They choose their own path. So the earth is going to fill up with corruption. And of course, you get in 6-4, this Nephilim, this special group. And so it kind of gets washed. So that's why Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is a tough passage because you got sons of God, daughters of men, Nephilim. And it's like, where does this passage come from? But it's sitting in the midst of a larger passage. And lest I forget, remind me to come back and talk about distractions of men. <laughs> <laughs> We're never distracted, right? <laughs> right. Well, see, you do bring up that passage, um, Jude 6 and 7, okay? If I've got my Bible scholars out there. It says, okay. and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these he has kept in eternal restraints under darkness for judgment of the great day. So, and then we also see there's a supporting scripture, which is 2 Peter. Two and four, for God did not spare angels when they sinned, but caught, cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness held for judgment. Yeah. What happened to cause God to cast those angels into hell? What did they do? Yeah. Now, probably the bigger sin of the angels was when a third of them decided to rebel with Lucifer. The, the archangel, if you will, that we call Satan. So when he uh, mounts his, his utter display of selfish pride and lifting himself up against God, and we see that in Ezekiel, he takes a third of the heavenly host. Now, angels have order just like men. And it appears that the, the, the more disobedient, the more uh, raucous of the angels, God has limited their, their influence by banishing them early on. Whether we're looking at Jude 6 and 7 or 2 Peter 2, 4, um, it wasn't because of what was happening here in Genesis 6 okay. that those angels were penalized. It probably was that which took place before the earth ever took its shape and form when Satan fell from his glory. But there are those who will try to link Jude 6 and 7, 2 Peter 2, 4 to this text right here, Genesis 6, 4, and say that was the problem. I don't believe that. Um, that wouldn't get you cast, if you will, into utter darkness and chains and stuff like that. No, the rebellion that happened in heaven at the time that Lucifer decided to raise himself up. Now that would get you a place in utter darkness waiting for eternal destruction because that was an outright display of disobedience in the face of God and God could not have it. And I'm grateful to God that there are myriads and myriads of angels um, who are still left, um, which we might call the good angels <laughs> to do his bidding uh, because enough of them did leave. And, and so God has his messengers. But I cannot imagine being in the presence of God and, and flaunting your greatness in front of the almighty God. That would get you chained up for all of eternity. That would get you chained up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's this book that I read, and that's what kind of started our conversation called The, the okay. Rise and the Fall of the Nephilim. And we have this author, basically, he's put his own story together. And if anybody, you know, is a Google book person, it's written by Scott Allen Roberts. And he's making some interesting claims. He's trying to glue these passages together in a way that I don't think are necessarily biblically sound. But he specifically references passages from the book of Enoch. And you mentioned Enoch is part of that line of Adam. 
and that that book was omitted from the Bible. I know it was omitted from the Catholic canon. Why was the book of Enoch removed from the Bible? Right. Let me, let me, before answering directly the book of Enoch, because it's one of those lost books. Um, it, it's uh, not even part of the Apocrypha that you mentioned. There's 14 books yes. in, in other. So this, this book did not have enough literary support in its day to be included in scripture. We know that there's a number of books, including the Apocrypha, that had some following, but not enough to be called scripture. So there's stories, good and bad, uh, some believable, some not believable. Matter of fact, I pulled out my Septuagint the other night to look at the books of the Apocrypha to see some of the stuff in there. There's a book called Wisdom in there. And I do like some of the some of the passages in there. They sound much like our 66 books that we have in the Holy Bible. But then there's passages even in wisdom that go, nah, that sounds a little far-fetched. I don't know about that. And it, it just hasn't spiritually touched my ear to, to be called scripture and acceptable. But we realize that there are, there are those who will try to intrigue the mind and the heart. They found pieces that sound good. Um, and there is some following in some sects, some regions of the world, which say, hey, listen, I don't know why the book of Enoch was not included. Well, it wasn't included because God didn't want it <laughs> included in the, the major treaties of his word. But, but when, when we think about these, and it gives me reason to go back. So give me just a minute to go back to Genesis chapter four. At the okay. very end of chapter four, verse 26, it says to Seth also a son was born and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. A huge phrase that the listeners, readers need to keep in mind. So there was a time that God was so close that they didn't have to call on it. But God's going to step back as, as corruption takes over the earth. And I need to talk about it. I called it the ABCs. I was getting ready for our time together and thinking about all the things, you know, <laughs> as you That's run through those various letters. So we'll, we'll talk about it. But, but people began to call on the name of the Lord. And then we move into chapter five. And we've got 10 patriarchs from Adam to Noah, a righteous line, sons of God, if you will. We move into chapter six. We've got this controversial passage, six, one to four. But if you look at six, five, it says the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Pause right there. So one man finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. Men are calling on the name of the Lord but there's a whole lot who are not. And let's put the Nephilim in there. Let's put Enoch into there. There's a whole group of folk not calling on the name of the Lord. And so we see in chapter six, where God is going to raise up this one man and out of him, he's going to bring salvation. It's going to tell him to build this great big boat, you know, three and a half football fields long. It, it, it's several stories high, three or four stories high. It is a huge boat. But out of that ark, he's going to weave this story of salvation. And so when I think about the rise and the fall of the Nephilim, great men, small men, men of renown, men of obscurity, people whose names have been written across billboards and on uh Facebook and Twitter and every other place that you can think about somebody's name being put. 
And then the people who nobody know of. Men great and small are going to go the same way because they have been distracted by other things in life. The righteousness of God has not been their appeal. They have not been thinking about serving the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, Psalm 16, I absolutely love, of being in his presence and enjoying his favor forever. There's a whole lot of people. That's not for them. No, they're about other things. And that's why we get that big, ugly list of all of the things that can possibly go wrong in this life, okay? <laughs> Where people get caught up in anger and bitterness and crimes and destruction, envy, fear, gluttony, hatred, injustice, jealousies, lies, maliceness, just outright nastiness, obsessions, opinions of all kinds. Listen, I could go through the A to Zs. We've got them all. The world is full of corruption and it bothers God that man's heart is only evil. Now, I may be getting ahead of the questions, but that word grieved is different than the word anger. You can get angered at a stranger. You can get angry at your friends and family. But when it comes to grieving, only those you love can grieve your heart. And God is grieved to his heart that the one he created just like him, who was to have rule and dominion over all the earth, has now decided that God is not good enough. That the daughters of men are more sexy than it is to be a member of the family of God. And, you know, in this day and time where you can get flesh at every realm, you know, they're looking on flesh and they have forgotten the God who created the flesh. So um, he, he uh, Scott Roberts is going to make these comments about the book. I've only briefly looked at his book, but it, it reminds me that we, even in our research, not to get lost, to try to rewrite God's story. Now he has written a wonderful story about salvation. All we need to do is get in the ark and be safe today. But lo and behold, we can get distracted by some pretty big creatures in this world. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would be great at this. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, let's go on and see what else this author says now. He makes an assertion. Mm -hmm. Now, while Adam and Eve, of course, were the first man and woman on earth, he suggests that Adam is not the father of Cain, but he actually instead is suggesting that the serpent is the father of Cain. What <laughs> biblical evidence do we have to support that Satan is Cain's father? Yeah, boy, that's really good. I don't know where he got that from. Hey, but to to all of our readers and all those watching, just turn to Genesis chapter four, verse one, where it says, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and conceived and bore Cain. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very clear. So I'm not exactly sure where he was going with that. that that's, a, that's, that's quite a run. No, she bore Cain and Abel and Seth. Now she had other children, but those are named so that we know that flesh gives rise to flesh. I'm going to come back to that point in just a little bit. You know, I teach biology um, and, and have been over the past five years. Um, anatomy and physiology is a favorite of mine. And when you talk anatomy and physiology, you have to talk about DNA. Hey, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit. <laughs> okay, we're going to unpack this even more. <laughs> you you get us into the story of the ark and that Noah found favor with God and he spared yeah. Noah and his lineage. What was happening on the earth that that made God just want to destroy it? You talk about all these things that were happening because we say God makes no mistakes. Yeah. Do do you think at some point it grieved his heart? I don't want to say he made a mistake. But he wanted to start all over again. Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, 
in my book, and this is this is not a poor plea, but in the book that I wrote came out in March of 2020, God's Perfect Timing, A Literal Approach to Chronology in the Bible, which is found all over the place, including Amazon. But in that book, I do talk about the fact that I think it's absolutely important um, that in understanding the timeline of God, it was only... 1800 and a few years from Adam to the flood. God wanted a righteous life, but in 1800 years, man had gotten so far from the blueprint of God. God's heart is full of pain, as it says right here in Genesis chapter six. He, he's regretted that he even made man on earth Grieved into his heart. But you know, when God gives us the control and the controls is to choose him or to choose not to follow him. And we all have free choice. And, and, and so much of the time in uh, ecclesiastical circles, we talk about free choice. Well, with free choice, we all have to stand on our choices and we're going to be judged based upon the choices. But God had always meant for us to choose him. Um, on Wednesday night, I was doing, or Wednesday afternoon, I was doing a Bible study for Wednesday night. And, and we were looking at a passage where it talks about being pulled by God into his righteousness. If I don't allow God to pull me into his righteousness, if I fight God and, and, and I'm, I'm warring with my decisions, whether to follow him or do my own thing, then he'll give me over to myself and I'll find myself on the outs. But what I would rather be is pulled by his Holy Spirit where God can give me everything I need for godliness, for holiness, to be considered one of his children and to one day be in his presence for all of eternity. And that choice is really what it is. I know oftentimes in the church, we talk about, fighting sin. Well, I, I've stopped talking to my people about fighting sin. I'm not warring against sin. Jesus already won that battle. No, what I am is fighting with myself to allow self to be pulled by God into his righteousness. No, because, you know, just about the time we think we got ourselves together. Hey, God, I'm okay. I can do this on my own. And if he lets me go, I'm in trouble. I no longer have his spirit. I no longer have his blessings. And he waits till I stub my toe, hit my head and come to my senses like that, that prodigal son and say, man, what am I doing? I need to go home and talk to my father because I done messed up all over again. Man continually messes up. And, and if you look at Ezekiel 18, and I, I turn to readers, Ezekiel 18, verse 23, God has no desire in the death of anyone. But if we don't choose him, death is the only thing we can expect to be separated eternally from him. No, what I need to do is choose Jesus Christ, where the moment I choose him, I have eternal life. Although I may cease to breathe and be experienced on this side, I open my eyes on the other side. And for all of eternity, I'll be in his presence and enjoy him forever. And so this is what chapter six is going to remind us that Noah is one man in a world gone bad, a world that has absolutely gone evil. OK, corruption everywhere. But Noah is willing to walk with God. And see, I love that phrase that reminds me right down there in six, nine, Noah walked with God. And in 618, this is Genesis, Genesis 6, 9, Genesis 618. Noah walks with God. And in 618, God establishes a covenant with Noah and his family. And if you and I walk with God, he will establish his covenant with us, a covenant that will keep us, that will never let us go, that will promise us that um, weeping may endure for a moment, but joy will come in the morning. When we finally see his face and enjoy him forever. So walking with God allows us to experience the fullness of his covenant. And that's what chapter six is. I've got a covenant. 
I've got a plan of salvation. I've got a, I've got a, a, a whole future for you and your family. But don't get lost in the Nephilim. Don't get lost in the daughters of men. Do not get lost in the ways of the world. Keep your eyes on Jesus and live. And man, that is so much more important for me to keep my eyes on him and live. Listen, when I talk about walking by uh, walking with God, what is that? Walking by faith in obedience. And if you think about calling on him, prayer, faith, obedience, prayer. There is my trilogy. Girl, I'm telling you. That's, that'd be me. That is my, okay? <laughs> faith, F-O-B. obedience. Right, F-O-B. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's where we need to be. <laughs> Not to be confused with fraternal order of police, right? F-O-B. Right. <laughs> right. Well, we got our own F-O-B. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Now you, you've made some interesting comments about the Nephilim. How it's just kind of dropped in there, and then we see another passage about the Nephilim, and that's in yeah. Numbers. So if everybody's got their Bible, Numbers thirteen, thirty-two, and thirty-three, and it says, "So they bought a bad report of the land, which they had spied out to the sons of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants.'" And all the people whom we saw in it are people of great stature. We also saw the Nephilim there. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So I guess this is the report that's being given to Moses in the Hebrews. And you see this term being used again. So again, where do these Nephilim come from? Because this is now, they were before the flood. They're now showing up after the flood. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, Did they, is it, am I'm, I to assume they survived the flood? Where'd they come ooh, from? Good, good. No, but watch this. And I cannot account for this, but this is one of those, I don't want to call it a miracle, but this is one of those, those mysteries of God that we can ask him when we finally see him for ourselves. So the Nephilim are destroyed in the flood. But the Nephilim have DNA. Now here, I'm going to bring in just a little biology for the sake of the listeners. Okay. okay. I don't want to get lost. But cell theory in biology says that cells arise only from pre-existing cells. Cells arise only from pre-existing cells. So if the Nephilim are pre-diluvian and post-diluvian, before the flood, after the flood, there are some cells that survive. Now, biologically speaking, I don't know how those cells survive. We do realize that the Anakin, or the, the sons of Anak, the Anakim, are distant relatives of the Nephilim and the Rephaim are uh, descendants of the Nephilim. So there are several groups that are descendants of these very gigantic people. We realize Anak was a man of great stature, had sons of great stature. So when I read this text here in Numbers 13, 33, and, 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 and you know, it was good just having a little bit of time of prepping and finding various passages about it. Um, the children of Israel realized that these giants were still around. Well, we still have some giants in our day. Um, Shaq. <laughs> Manubo. Manubo. Oh, yes. Listen, <laughs> there are some folk who are extremely tall who've got cells in their bodies that that heredity um, plays a part. I don't honestly know how there was this survival of this lineage when all life was destroyed, except Noah and those who were with him in the ark. But here's one of the takeaways, biblically speaking, because we can't answer everything in the Bible. 
There are questions about the word of God that we just have to leave there till we see God for himself. The Bible is not a complete history book. I do, I do take it at face value. I do believe in a literal approach to chronology in the Bible, as I've written about. So I take it at face value. I just know that it is possible um, for cells to survive even a year-long flood, some way, somehow, and that future generations, uh, some things may show up in. And in the, the sons of Anak, um, in the Rephaim, we see those particular ones there. Does it mean that uh, the Nephaim were resistant or that they totally survived? I don't believe so. I, I believe the flood did what God wanted it to do so that God had a reset and that he started all over again. But we once again see that there's the magic of biology. And I often talk to my kids about the magic of biology. I talk about biology because biology is nothing more than the study of life. I wanna know how God did it. I realized that despite 25 years of practice in anesthesia, I still have a lot of questions out there, okay? Um, okay. Um, and my, and, and I realized that that we will never fully know some things. I take great joy in a passage, Deuteronomy 29, 29. The things that God has made known to us are for us and for our knowledge and understanding, our edification. But the things that God has kept to himself, that's for God. And he's saving us some surprises so that when we finally get a chance to talk to him in eternity, yeah, uh, this will be one of those things. Hey, God, tell me the story about the Nephilim. Tell me how they could possibly have survived and the children of Enoch would have come along and the Rephaim, because Joshua and them, they're going to have a whole lot of fighting to do in taking the land of Canaan and they got to fight these big giants. Lord, why would you allow them to survive? Uh, David had his Goliath and there you come. Goliath, if you will, is one of the the offspring of these great big people. We realized he this dude was was almost nine feet tall. I don't know how we got there. I don't see people walking around like that. <laughs> and the Manuk bulls of the world, they're few and far between. Far between. And it takes enough for them to get out of a chair. What less go to a battlefield and fight anybody? But nevertheless, we realized that they did survive some way somehow. But that's my DNA. Um, I'm I'm sticking to it. I don't know. How to put it. I don't know how. But but the one thing we've learned, and I, I I hope your readers don't mind me talking a little bit, and, and listeners talking just a little bit biology. There was a project called the Human Genome Project from 1990 to 2003. It was a one billion dollar project. 27 countries involved, and we actually decoded the human genome. Now we're able to do it with such speed and rapidity. You can spit in a little vial and give somebody $99 and you can have your DNA given back to you in, in, in a couple of weeks worth of time by Ancestry.com or 23andMe or something else. We can now tell you where you came from and the whole nine yards. But it took 13 years to actually decode it. What we learned is that what makes us human? is that DNA has a lot of repetitive coils, okay? And DNA typically come in, in, in million, uh, in strands of millions of codons. Now that's a whole nother study. But the replication is what makes us human because you have to have the replication. Well, these giants just have more replications, if you will, same material, just more replication. There's God. He, he said, listen, you call them giants. I just spin the DNA wheel just a little bit more. And there you go. So, um, hey, we're going to learn a lot in eternity to come. Well, so then you answer my question because you talk about Goliath. Oh, Was he, what you feel that he's a descendant or related to the Nephilim. Yeah, he's a descendant.
say he's the giant of the day now watch god every time as a matter of fact on my computer if i open it up right at the top um it says um seeds of fear lead to acts of faith so many times in our lives we face giants all of us have faced a giant in our lifetime. It may not have been a creature on two legs and nine feet tall, but we've had giants that we've had to face to square off against and show forth our faith in the midst of facing our giants. Man, there's a book out there and I, I think I preached through it. I taught about it. Giants do fall. All of us have to realize in our lives, yeah, you can take down the giants. You just have to have more faith than fear. Fear will get you running from the giant. Faith will get you a slingshot saying, in the name of the Lord, I'm going to take you out because I'd rather stand on God's side than stand on your side. And so... <laughs> Yeah, Goliaths are there. And in every generation, people face these great big fears and, and fearsome folk. But if we have great faith, the God we serve will take care of us. And you know what? The, the, the Goliath in, in Christ Jesus' day, the Goliath was on Golgotha. It wasn't Goliath. It was Golgotha. And he went to Golgotha and slayed Golgotha. He looked like he took a mortal wound, but by Sunday morning, when he gets up with all power, he said, man, you may have, you may have knocked me out for a moment, but I'm going to show you that giants do fall. So there you go. <laughs> Dr. Woodard, <laughs> you are amazing, and I knew you would be. I'm going <laughs> to give you the last word. Well, you know, I do want, I do want um, your, the listeners to appreciate the fact that although we've got Nephilim and we've got, um, we've got the Goliaths, we've got, um, we've got a whole lot of things out there that can cause us to be fearful and afraid, to cause us to just wonder if God really cares. The mere fact that God was grieved in his heart 
And I was having a conversation with my wife last night, little pillow talk about 1 a.m. talking about fears, is that we all have got to get to that place where we're not fearful of things we see. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against rulers and and principalities and authorities, authorities and spiritual wickedness in high places. And Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6 reminds us of that. And so we have to be shod with the outfit that God wants us to be shod with, the helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness, um, shoes with the preparation of the gospel, uh, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, realizing that the belt of righteousness and, and the things that God has given unto us will save us in our day. And if we are saved in our day, I love that text in Ephesians 6, because it said, after you've done all the preparation, stand still and and wait till you get your marching orders. And I think so many times we're like, hey, God, I'm prepared for battle. He said, no, you're not ready. You got to take my spirit and and, and my spirit is going to tell you when it's time to go. And you know what? I, I often think about the judges and I think about like Gideon's battle. He said, Lord, we're ready to fight. He said, no, you just need a lantern. You just need a light. Because uh, when I tell you, let your little light shine and I'm going to fight the battle. I'm going to clear out the enemy and you can stand in the glory that I present. Listen, I often tell myself, even after the preparation has been made, after the study has been done, when you're ready to mount the pulpit, when you're ready to get in front of the camera and talk, you better be walking in the spirit. You better be allowing God to do his thing with you. And then when it's all said and done, he gets the glory and you go, wow, God, I'm so amazed that you were able to use me in that moment. He said, well, you were prepared, but you need to get out the way sometimes and realize that, (laughs) that, that I take care of the giants and you take care of the small stuff. Walk with me by faith. Uh, walk in faith and obedience. Be prayerful about the things that cause your heart uh, to melt every now and then. And then uh, face life with that determination that for God I live and for God I die. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy certainly will come in the morning. They that call on the name of the Lord will mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not get weary. They'll walk and not faint. Listen, all of us need to believe in God and and stop worrying about some make-believe characters (laughs) who, who, who have, who got... They got some renown, but they aren't no match for the God we say we love and serve. And so, man, I really appreciate this time. And you know what? It is good to be where God uh, wants you to be. And so, Michelle, I thank you so much for allowing me to just have a few minutes to kind of say my piece. And I know Scott, he probably has a real good book out there. Um, I'll look at it sometime in, in more detail. <laughs> but I'm just so busy looking at the word of God. Word. It's hard to look at anything. <laughs> and that's why I came to you because I said the Dr. Woodard will be able to unpack this. And I think, you know, our audience certainly has had a treat with you. I knew it would be everything that it turned out to be. And I appreciate you more than you will ever know. Dr. Woodard, thank you for coming on Tabernacle Talks. Dr. Michelle, thank you. And listen, love Tabernacle Talks. And and I want everybody to keep up with you because you are special.